And now, now it works. <laughs> Although the green line was already there. Uh, so, my name is uh, Ivan Medenica, I'm the artistic director of Beetle Festival and I want to wish you welcome to Belgrade and to the 56th edition of the Beetle Festival and to the second plenary meeting of IETM that we are organizing in Belgrade. As many of you know, uh, the first plenary meeting of IETM was in 2005 in Belgrade and it was organized by one very important Belgrade institution it's called Dom Aladine, House of Youth, and its director at that time, Milan Lucic. So, Milan, where are you? Let us greet Milan Lucic. <laughs> Milan put very high standards for of Yugoslav history where our former president Tito, one of the sessions will be held in the Marshal Salon, so we have still tribute to Marshal Tito in this very building, which was a house of syndicates in socialistic times, so you will see Tito while you are, you are here. Uh, so when Marshal Tito uh, launched the non-aligned countries movement, movement uh, with uh, President uh, Nasser of Egypt and Nehru of India. That's why Belgrade and Bitev not wa was not only a meeting poise point between uh, ideologically divided East and West, but also between culturally uh, divided let's say, north and south. Um, we like to believe in a legend that says that at the first edition of BTEF, Jerzy Grotowski met Living Theater and uh, its founders, uh, Judith Malina and Julian Beck, and as you know, the rest is history. Grotowski was invited to the States by Malina and Beck, and uh, uh, was giving lectures there, or organizing uh, uh, workshops, uh, etc. So it's one of the examples, this legend, of the importance of this exchange that BTEF provided for the whole uh, theater world in the 60s. Of course, in the 90s, um, the Berlin Wall disappeared, Europe was unified, but Yugoslavia at the same time was disappearing in a bloody civil uh, war. So the geostrategic situation, position of this city and this country was completely changed. Uh, we stayed completely out of any uh, international exchanges and networks. We were isolated uh, for a few years and after that, since the end of 90s, I think that I would like to believe that BTEF started regaining uh, the position that it had because, unfortunately, 
Nowadays, we have new walls in Europe and in the whole world. Not only the new Iron Curtain, which is falling in this very moment uh, uh, in, in Europe, but other walls as well. Just to give you one example and then I will finish. Uh, as far as I know, the first wall that was built in Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall was a wire fence that Orban uh, constructed, I don't want to say Hungarians, but Orban and his regime constructed on the frontier with Serbia to stop migrants to enter Hungary at, and at the same time European Union. So with all these wire fences and new walls in Europe, I think that festivals like BTEF could become once again meeting places of theater makers coming from different parts of the world. So that's why I am so happy to see such a big number of guests coming all around the world at the 56th BTEF. That was all I wanted to tell you. Uh, once again, to wish you welcome to Belgrade. I hope you will have a nice time at our festival in many of our programs. And now I will leave the floor uh, to Ausa uh, Rikerdotir. Uh, I hope it was, it was okay as a pronunciation. And I would like to thank her and the board of ITM for choosing Belgrade once again to be the host of this very important plenary meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. And thank you, the whole of the BTEF team. It is so great to be back in Belgrade. It is wonderful to see you all, IATM members, and international colleagues from all over the world. This meeting has been long in the making, and our one and only Francisca will tell you in the making ever since she came to IATM, and that was long before I did. Yet, I'm also an oldie in the IATM member sense, and I remember very well the Belgrade plenary of 2005, Milan, where some of the best IATM dance moves were created, and we are expecting no less. But, in all seriousness, we are very grateful to be here, and I want to thank the partners that have made this IATM Belgrade plenary possible, which is, first of all, Beta Festival, the whole team of Beta for the trust, friendship, and dedication to IATM and our joint course. And on that note, I want to salute BTEF for their clear stance denouncing the crackdown on the Euro Pride March here in Belgrade just a few days ago. as well as giving the stage to the artist Marina Davidova at the festival opening, where she stated, it is very important to understand that on February 24, Russia attacked not only Ukraine, but also declared war on its own culture. I encourage you to go to the BTEF festival website and read her whole speech. We also want to give thanks to Novi Sad 2022 Capital of Culture for an inspiring, interesting, full-on pre-trip trip yesterday, which we, the group that joined the trip, thoroughly enjoyed. The theme of this meeting, and I love it, work hard, live harder, does not grow out of nothing. It is derived from items focus this year on fairness and working condition, which is horribly fitting considering the hellish time we, the performing arts, have been experiencing lately and which we have not seen the end of. 
This meeting is very, very much the co-creation of PTEF and IETM. And moreover, we in Brussels have let go. We have trusted our partners. We have allowed their UCO futurism and their spot on current perspectives lead the process. This is very much in line with our network's joint decision during rewiring the network, which is to engage the membership and enhance the ownership of the members of the IHM content. We have really enjoyed being part of this co-creation process, and I very much want to thank the whole BTEF content committee for our very good collaboration. A final thought from me. We have very many newcomers here in the hall and at this meeting. And I welcome you all wholeheartedly. Not only do we have the new strong group Global Connectors with us, but also several new members that have joined the network in the last strange years. And to all of you older and oldies, please, please go out of your way, welcome the new members, Share and give of yourself, it will all come back to you. I came across a safer space guidelines of Urban APA, which is a Helsinki-based, anti-racist, feminist art community that acts as a platform for art events, new ways of doing, and discourses on the center of art. I like their positive approach and I'm going to leave you with a few quotes from Urban Appa's wise words. One, let's not assume consent, let's ask for it. Two, let's respect the physical, mental, and emotional boundaries of others as well as our own. Three, let's not assume the identity, sexuality, gender, health, or background of others. Four, Let's respect the opinions, beliefs, and experiences of others, even when they differ from our own. Five, let's be aware of our prejudices, privileges, behaviors, and the space we occupy. And last but not least, six, let's strive to act with a positive intent and take care of each other. Back to you, Ivan for introducing our keynote speakers. Thank you all, and again, it is fantastic to be back in Belgrade. Does it work now? Yes, it works. Also, thank you very much for these nice words uh, about BTEF and uh, the um, how to say attitudes we had towards some very controversial uh, events in this country. Now I have a uh, great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, whom I, know, whom I know pretty well, at least I know pretty well his work, but um, I will prefer to read some lines uh, from his biography, not to make any mistake. Uh, our keynote speaker is Tomislav Medak, who is from Zagreb. Uh, Croatia, and who has just defended his PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, before that, he was a PhD researcher at, at Coventry University Center for Post-Digital Cultures. Uh, his PhD thesis was on the political econo economy of technology and the planetary ecological crisis. He is also a member, a part of an artistic platform or team, team for theory and uh, publishing team as well, which is a multimedia institute, MAMA, from Zagreb. And he is also a member of the very important uh, platform for contemporary performing arts in Croatia, Bad Co, for which I'm sure a lot of you have already heard. Uh, his research interests are in technology, capitalist development, at, and post-capitalist transition, with a particular focus on the planetary ecological crisis, technoscience, and intellectual property. So, this was briefly an introduction of our speaker. 
I'm sure that you will all enjoy this uh, uh, keynote speech and afterwards, of course, uh, before the party, uh, we will have time for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan, for uh, this lovely introduction. Um, I would also like to uh, thank uh, in advance Bojana Karaja, uh, Karajovic, uh, Mariana Cvetkovic, Ksenija Đurović, Francisca Silguero, uh, and Jan Mrdi, uh, who, will, who will be also helping me with uh, my slides today. Um, I feel a little bit intimidated sitting here uh, on this big stage. You are, I can barely discern your faces uh, in the audience. Um, I'm not typically in a situation of giving a keynote talk at a conference of this size, and particularly not in the room of this size. Um, but I see that you are a cheery audience, and that gives me a little bit of uh, relief. Hopefully, I will not overstretch your attention and sour your, uh, sour your mood. Um, OK, so m my talk is titled, um, as you can see, Dance uh, against labor. Um, Jan, if I could ask you to go to the next slide and start the video. Uh, next slide, please. This was a fragment from my theater company's 2008 film, Time Bombs. Based on three performances we devised in the period 2007 to 2009 on the topic of labor. To be precise, it is the opening sequence of our 2008 performance, One Poor and One Zero, a reenactment of workers leaving the linear factory um, film from 1895. The central concern of that performance uh, was on how the representation of industrial labor and the social choreographing of laboring masses evolved and transformed throughout the age of cinema. Modernization in the 19th and the 20th century Europe and United States catalyzed historically unprecedented concentration of laboring masses in the cities whose mobility, movement, and motion were organized and choreographed through larger industrial capitalist relations. In this talk, I want to reflect on how modern dance as an art form emerged and developed against the historical trajectory of these relations, and particularly against the structural yet embodied conditions of proletarian labor. While providing a speculative theoretical framing of this problematic, 
Uh, as a now retired theater maker, abusing audiences' patience with recollections from their former work, I will intersperse my exposition with additional fragments of One Poor and One Zero and other artworks in whose development I have participated and which that also address the concern of labor by means of dance. Next slide, please. In this talk, I will firstly situate the emergence of dance as an art form within the emerging industrial capitalist modernity, which ushered in both bourgeois nation states as a form of internal social regulation and imperialism as a form of global economic expansion. The rapidly maturing early capitalism was characterized by, first, a subjection of bodies to the industrial process of production, second, an abstract mediation of social relations through commodity exchange, and third, a gradual exclusion of pre-modern routines, gestures, and rituals from the capitalist organization of everyday life. My fundamental claim is that modern dance, both in its popular and its artistic form, on which I will focus in this talk, absorbed and reworked that capitalist constitution. Modern dance's concern with, firstly, freely expressive bodies unfettered from coercion, secondly, choreographic composition of collective movement and abstract dance relieved of conventions, and thirdly, pursuit of cultural difference, provided at once a representation and a performance of larger social relations. That is, an embodied expression of the bourgeois ideology of freedom and spontaneity of dynamic social relations, and thus a form of what Andrew Hewitt has termed a social choreography. It is within these registers that dance's socially reflexive, critical, and potentially counter-hegemonic capacity resided and maybe still continues to reside. However, from this close relation to capitalist modernity follows that in the geohistorical context where capitalist development was stunted by cap socialist revolutions or was subjected to imperial conditions, dance as an art form did not undergo a comparable process of constitution as it did in the West. Obviously, there is a lot of uh, geopolitical terms that were thrown around already earlier, so we can discuss them maybe in the Q&A. But rather, uh, so uh, undergo a comparable process of constitution as it did in the West, but rather followed a different formation. Using the example of post-socialist semi-periphery semi of Croatia, in this talk I will secondly suggest that even the transfer of organizational forms that define dance as an artistic field in its Western tradition does not lead to uniform development. And thus, that the modern, postmodern, and contemporary dance's dominant mo modes of presentation, techniques, and discourse are neither general nor generalizable. They are rather provincially Western, or as once Janis Janša claimed, Janis Janša, the Slovenian uh, performing artist, uh, it's characteristic of old liberal capitalist democracies. Still, the non-Western contexts are not, particularly not after 1989, outside of global capitalist relations. They operate within them, assimilating their forms and being assimilated by their forms. Unlike in the heyday of post-World War II industrial development, the sphere of employment is no longer a stable foundation of social integration. Informality, underemployment and social insecurity are now a shared condition of working classes across societies with, very, with various levels of economic affluence. Thus, thirdly, I will claim that stable industrial capitalist relations against which modern dance as an artistic field constituted itself are a thing of, a, of, a, of the past, and that this is reflected in how the field has been transforming over the last 40 years, deconstructing and reconstructing its own forms of production, artistic presentation, and institutional reproduction. I will claim that the crisis of labor relations can be read as and from the crisis of dance. Finally, 
I will invite us all to consider how dance can reflect and intervene in the present restructuring of labor relations and recomposition of laboring masses through platform capitalism. Next slide, please. Can you follow me? Okay, I heard some voices over there. Thank you. Um, so first, to situate dance in the capitalist modernity. This part is a little bit dense, but um, hopefully you can bear with me. Aesthetic forms stand in a relation of co-constitution with structures of social relations and, and institutional forms these relations assume. Aesthetic forms are foundational for our orientation and agency as they provide us with a shared scheme of representation of our social reality. According to Andrew Hewitt, it is dance that holds a position of privilege in crystallizing that shared scheme of representation in the period of early capitalist modernity. Dance is a collective and performative practice that both allows spectators to observe the complexity of dynamic social relations and allows participants to experientially integrate that complexity of social interplay by dancing. Starting from the analysis of Schiller's appreciation of English dances, where all social ranks are equally allowed to participate in the choreography, and hence equally represent the totality of that movement, Hewitt detects a historic turning point in the late 18th century where dance acquires a socially general character. It stops being either a representation of courtly decorum or an emphatic exercise of popular ritual, and becomes a vessel for a spontaneous ideology of bourgeois society driven by norms of social mobility, equality, and freedom. From that point on, the representation of social dynamic whole and participation in its collective performance, that which Hewitt calls social choreography, acts as an organizing principle of both pop popular social dances which soon becomes subsumed under the commodi commodified logic of entertainment, and dance as an art form, which slowly, slowly develops into an autonomous artistic field concer concerned with the choreographic exploration of body and movement. The separation between the popular and artistic no longer being structured by social stratification, but rather by separation between the commodified and non-commodified sphere spheres of social production. Whilst, pop, whilst popular dances will have to remain outside of the scope of the present analysis, the privileged position of dance as an art form within capitalist modernity and its performance of bourgeois ideology are in need of further specification. There are several other processes that come to define its nexus to capitalist modernity as they both matured into the 20th century. Firstly, modern dance extracts the body and movement from the sphere of industrial production, where these are subsumed under the dictate of industrial machinery and productivity. Secondly, it dematerializes the product, that thus operating in analogy with the abstract mediation of social relations through commodity exchange. The former finds its expression in modern dance's lasting focus on the freely expressive body and movement, the latter in its lasting focus, focus on abstract composition. Thirdly, by differentiating itself out from the sphere of production, uh, productive labor, where machinic choreography of industrial production subsumes the body and movement, uh, the modern dance starts to constitute its autonomous field around the logic of choreographic exploration of body and movement, their compositional, kinesthetic, and expressive capacities. This autonomy, which will gradually become instituted into a fully-fledged artistic field, encompassing aspects such as dance techniques, choreographic schools, dance ensembles, and hierarchical structures of production, will enable modern dance to build its own formal language and reflexive structures allowing it to fully emancipate itself from the courtly decorum of the Italian stage and conventions of ballet. Fourthly, with the movements of manufacturing machinery instrumentalized 
uh, while the movement of manufacturing machinery instrumentalized the movement of the workers, the movement of dancing bodies was produced out of sel creative self-causation. It is in that imminent free movement of dancing bodies, liberated from the external necessity of labor, that the fund fundamental ideological operation of modern dan dance unfolds, something that Bernard Zweig has called a vitalist synthesis of the body and movement, where either the movement of the body is a singular expression of subject's inner experience, or the body is a crystallization of a singular inner impulse to move. In Boena, wor Boena's words, movement becomes ontologically bound to the body. Fifthly, the exceptionalism of the dancing bodies gives it freedom to assume an exploratory and transformative relation to various existing kinesthetic registers, Gest gestural or quotidian comportments that increasingly become governed by the modern organization of life and commodified consumption, or ritualistic, spiritual, and folkloristic practices that increasingly become suppressed from the modern world as its exotic other. Difference and otherness as opposed to uniformity and identity uh, that define capitalist comportments, thus become modern dance's lasting commitment. Reacting to the dualisms between work and leisure, dependency and freedom from work, corporeal and spiritual, manual and intellectual that are characteristic of the process of capitalist modernity, modern dance embraces spiritual practices that prime the body and spirit of the dancer to the requirements of artistic expression. Finally, whilst modern dance operates at a critical distance toward the sphere of labor and capitalist modernization, work ethics nonetheless finds its way into dance in the form of techniques which subject the dancing body to, this, to a strenuous practice, disciplining it to achieve mastery and virtuosity of performance. In fact, while competition in the labor market requires from the worker to maintain the capacity to labor, meaning her strength, her health, her sanity, the dancer becomes the epitome of the power to endure and to transform. Nowhere is the political unconscious of dance more clearly expressed than in the ablest spectacle of self-transformation achieved through self-disciplining. A dancing body is a negation of laboring body, but at the same time, it's purest crystallization. An ideal laboring body, yet, yet withdrawn from the process of production. Next slide, please. The constitutive withdrawal of the body and movement from the industrial process of, of production in modern dance sheds light on why the interruption in modern dance's development that was brought about by socialist revolutions is not simply a case of stunted modernization, but a different trajectory of development. Not a derailing or belatedness, but an altogether different uh, formation. Socialist revolutions have all taken place in countries where capitalist modernization was, its in, was in its early stages, and the social mass of bodies was still not fully organized by the exigencies of industrial process of production. Thus, parallel sh shock brought about by a rapid socialist modernization that mobilized masses of producers into a collective, programmatic, and conscious process of constituting a new society and a constructivist merging of productive and social life precluded dance art from forming as an autonomous field vis-a-vis -vis the sphere of production. Rather than constituting and instituting itself as an autonomous field of choreographic inquiry, da dance as an art form developed either in dialogue with ballet, musical theater, or more contemporary art forms such as film or performance, or as, repre as representational forms of collective choreography, such as sled. In the background, you can see a photo from Betko's 2009 piece, The League of Time, in which we have reconstructed some of the programmatic socialist efforts to overcome the separation of 
coerced laboring and free, free leisurely expressive body. While dance in socialist society is thus developed as an undercurrent through and in dialogue with other artistic and social forms, the modern dance proper uh, appear, mostly appeared as a continuation of vestigial forms of rudimentary bourgeois culture in socialism, or as a direct borrowing from the capitalist center without grounds for autonomous institutional uh, development. Consider post-socialist Croatia. Over the last 15 years, the dance field in Croatia has made huge inroads in achieving what are perceived to be institutional milestones of a fully constituted autonomous artistic field within a national culture. It got its National Dance Center with the opening of Zagreb Dance Center, separate funding under the Cultural Commission for Drama and Dance Art at the Ministry of Culture, and a BA and MA level dance education program at the Zagreb Academy of Dramatic Arts. Thus, it would seem that dance has completed the paradigmatic passage from an unacknowledged and marginalized art form into an institutionally differentiated field such as it exists across the cultural systems of all liberal capitalist democracies in the West, where modern and contemporary dance have, after all, emerged and evolved in what is assumed to be their paradigmatic form. With that, the process of belated modernization on the periphery, only temporarily interrupted by an alternative socialist modernization, would have seemingly reached its completion. This schematic developmental path of dance as an artistic field implicitly, implicitly dominates the self-understanding in the field. Its actors frequently argue from a perspective of institutional underdevelopment of our cultural system, and it's lagging behind other, mostly Western European contexts. There, the dance is truly recognized as an art form, holds a position of prominence in the cultural system, and has all the support structures needed to achieve significance in the national and international cultural contexts. Yet these actors are frequently confronted with the experience that the introduction of an institutional sol solution fails to achieve comparable effects it has purpor purportedly uh, achieved uh, in more developed contexts. Fifteen years later, the dance center in Zagreb remains captured and marginally important. The commission does not have ample funds to help develop the field, and the dance program is always struggling with the lack of faculty and resources. This experience reflects the fact that the evolutionary process cannot be transplanted, evolutionary process, excuse me, cannot be transplanted from one sociopolitical context to another, nor can the introduction of an institutional solution bring the evolution of a certain context from one stage into the other, another. That which we considered as, consider as belated and troubled process of catching up with the capitalist center is nothing else by a, but a transfer of institutional forms into a context where the structure of social relations and already existing organizational forms provide different affordances and different resistances to that transplanted form than they do in, than those that are in, the, in its original context. For these institutional forms to take hold and adapt in capitalist peripheries, cultural workers need to mobilize and organize to reappropriate them, giving them a different collectivist mode of operation. And they have to continuously struggle collectively to secure their precarious existence. Next slide, please. In the background, you can see Steve Baxton and Jerry Over Overington performing a contact improvisation, a technique or a practice first developed by Paxton in the 1970s. I have purposefully selected a video of a rehearsal of the technique rather than a performance such as After the Fall to emphasize the watershed moment that it represents, that contact improvisation represents, uh, and that we focused on in Betko's One Poor and One Zero. 
Uh, in the speculative history which that performance unfolds, we have claimed that contact improvisation was a true child of its own age, of the age of early post-industrialization in the Western industrial societies of the 1970s, the age of factory closures and the decline of mass industrial labor. Its development resonated with some of the most defining shifts of that age, most prominently the moving away from conflictual forms of social interaction based on class struggle to post-conflictual, post-conventional forms. The interaction in contact improvisation is spontaneous and reciprocal. It seeks to avoid all pre-existing social forms, gamesmanship and endocrine reactions. According to Steve Paxton, it is a situation where only two can win. It is non-hierarchical too. There is no master, no student no authority, no technical knowledge pre-given, simply the knowledge acquired in the exercise itself. Furthermore, throughout the industrial age, the labor remained hidden behind the factory gates. But now, now it started to permeate other segments of social, cognitive, and physical life. Famously, society became the factory. And accordingly, contact improvisation worked against the dominant understanding of dance, that defined dance through a regime of visibility, an external representation of what it is that the dancing body should be doing, and it worked to reveal the hidden labor of two dancing bodies in contact. Next slide, please. The post-industrialization in Western capitalist societies was the first step in the destabilization of industrial class relations. Steve Paxton's contact improvisation registers that unsettling as it channels some of the broader shifts in those Western capitalist societies. The waning of class conflict, growing existential fears, and a need for post-conventional forms of support and interdependence. If the sphere of productive labor and labor market provided the integrative mechanism of industrial capitalism, the modern dance built its autonomy vis-a-vis -vis that exact mechanism. The post-industrial neoliberalization, on the other hand, unsettled the, that integrative moment, and the postmodern dance started to question its own autonomy. The demise of two competing regimes with the world, within the world system after the fall of socialism and the opening of China has seen the capitalist relation become uncontested the division of labor global, the social inequality in large parts of the world grow deeper. The flexibilization and proletarianization of the working class across the entire capitalist world today is a second step in the destabilization of industrial class relations. The socially integrative role of labor has crumbled away. And as it has crumbled away, so has the constitutive relation of dance vis-a-vis -vis the sphere of productive labor. If flexibility, adaptability, and malleability of capacity to labor have become a general requirement for survival in the labor market, the, bro the border running between the subsumed body and the free body has been sus suspended. Not only is the self-transformative body of a dancer demanded now of everyone, but the prevalent condition of precarious employment and multiple careers are more than ever a lot of, the, of a growing global dancing community. The differentiation between the sphere of labor and the sphere of artistic expression built around the axis of heteronomy and autonomy of body and movement no longer seems to obtain. The laboring body is increasingly enjoyed, enjoined, commanded to be free and enterprising while the dancing body is increasingly demanded to show its, lab its laboring, to justify its privilege to free exploration and artistic work. The crumbling away of the constitutive distance of dance to capitalist labor sediments in various other aspects through which the dance field reproduces itself. As the number of trained, dancer, trained dancers has increased, Apprenticeships under master choreographers have become rarer. Stable employment in dance ensembles uh, also rare, and fragmentation and competition more expressed. 
Dancers shuffle between mostly performing for others and rarely making their own choreographies. Acquiring the broadest range of techniques and they're developing their own post-technique practices and scraping by by doing odd jobs on the side, producing small works, doing workshops and residencies, and rarely reaching professional and existential stability. As a reflection of this crisis of labor that is also a crisis of dance, since the end of the 1990s, the development of contemporary dance primarily in what is known as conceptual dance or choreographic theater, has been marked by an upending of conventions of theatrical representation and the suspension of what Bayana Sage has termed the ontological identity between the body and movement. The per performative formats seeks to seek to step outside of the scopic regime of theatrical stage, where the totality of choreographic relations is enacted and made visible for the audience and seeks other dispositives of encounter, including exhibition, gallery, and museum. Production formats are becoming fluid, smaller, and transformed into education, exhibition, or residency. Dance seems no longer able or willing to uphold the position of distance as an aesthetic form that provides a representation and in experiential integration of the capitalist social whole. Next slide, please. With that in mind, uh, I move on to the last and most recent work I want to discuss. In the background, you can see an image from, yes, indeed you can, uh, an image from Thomas Savage Getzen's work entitled Creation Pavilion, presented at this year's Venice Biennale of Art, a work to which I have contributed dramaturgical assistance and writing for catalog. It is an almost imperceptible work performed by five dancers twice a day across different pavilions in the Biennale. It is so subtle that it can go unnoticed by exhibition goers. I was present, I took this photo, nobody noticed that they were performing. But if you happen to notice it, or arrive informed about it, you will have witnessed a choreographed performance. What runs under the hood of that mutating performance is a complex concatenation of human and technological processes. Every day, a computer selects a lead story from among 350 newspapers or portals from 168 different countries, and then analyzes this lead story using a natural language processing model to produce parameters for the performance that day. This AI model is an animating mechanism instilling permutations intensity and undecidability into the work beyond the control of human actors. The work can thus be read as choreography in a conventional sense. People choreograph to perform, to dance, where five dancers perform a changing sequence of subtle actions across different national pavilions for the duration of the Biennale, but also as a choreography in an expanded sense involving abstractions and translations between interconnected socio-technical systems. Such socio-technical systems are commonly built these days to sustain the flow of information, labor and goods uh, in the capitalist world of spectacle, production and consum consumption, characterized by the ubiquity of intelligent devices and computer systems helping capture large sets of data and make inferences to optimize and accelerate those flows. Here, they are reappropriated to perform an almost imperceptible labor. Next slide, please. Savage Getson's untitled Creation Pavilion seems to indicate that we need to consider another twist in the process of how dance, how dance is reconfigured through the restructuring of capitalist labor relations. The sphere of labor is, over the last decade, increasingly subject to a post-digital regime of control that uses ubiquitous computing devices, constant data valence, and artificial intelligence to extract ever more surplus, surplus from an already flexibilized and proletarianized workforce. 
Those technological systems can analyze and reassemble the movements and skills of workers into simple, controllable tasks, creating the foundations for the modes of labor that political economist Ursula Hughes has called logged labor, where workers log on to platforms to be ordered around by, by automated systems. Workers in delivery services or fulfillment centers follow instructions given to them by mobile devices that track their every movement, yet obfuscate the complex socio-technical processes embedded in equally opaque corporate structures that organize their work. While early industrialization concentrated, concentrated masses of workers to operate increasingly complex machines, allowing them to develop a collective technical understanding of the factory system and thus to game and sabotage the apparatus of coercion, platformization isolates workers and disables any understanding of the concatenated processes that hide behind the interfaces these workers interact with through their devices. The five dancers in Venice are similarly synced through their mobile devices, which give them instructions and cues based on the daily analysis performed by an AI. This is in the back um, a schema created by Vladan Yoler, an artist from uh, Novi Sad, uh, just analyzing that concatenated socio-technical chain of processes. These dancers seemingly share a lot with logged laborers. However, and despite the numerous precise directives they are given, where to go, at what time, and how long, and what actions to perform, their capacity to relate to the spaces in which they perform, to each other, to visitors, to their own bodies, is purposefully heightened in the choreography, giving them a fleeting intelligence and interpretation of their collective endeavor. While the instructions and cues can have virtually endless permutations, the dancers help develop and in the end hold the reins, control the performative capacity of that concatenation of socio-technical systems. Theirs will be the sedimented and embodied knowledge of how they can control and modulate the system's intervention into the world. Those who design the system will largely remain deprived of this arcane embodied knowledge. Dance, and on this I finish, dance thus points to a sensorium of collective embodied intelligence that disaggregated laboring masses might sediment and accumulate against opaque AI systems coordinating their labor. The question is, how can those laboring masses come together to communicate that intimate knowledge and turn it against that system of control? And if the dance no longer can or should uphold its distance to the sphere of labor, something that I've claimed it has lost in the process of post-industrialization. What can the dancing collectivity, such as that one in uh, Venice, convey from its experience to a collectivity of log logged laborers? Labors, sorry. Without offering any definitive answers, I want to leave us op uh, with that open question. I want to invite you to a discussion you now what is dance in the age of platform work thank you i know i'm standing between you and the, the reception so we can take maybe a couple of questions um, uh, I guess there are people with mic going around, or oh yeah, there. So raise your hand and uh, ask a question or comment, uh, or whatever if you like. If you have a question, remark, or you're also thirsty, Goran Tomka. Over there. No, but please, come on. Use the mic. Sorry for um, keeping you a bit longer, but 
thanks uh, for the intellectual gymnastics. And um, what I was wondering is there's this big debate in post-capitalist uh, circles. Is it post-capitalism or anti-capitalism or beyond capitalism and so on, which are very interesting. Uh, and then I would similarly maybe ask what do you see as a difference between um, dancing against labor and dancing after labor? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for the question. It's a difficult one. Now, obviously, here in, in this talk, against has an ambivalent meaning. So it means vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, like the, the fundamental claim is that modern dance as, as a field has emerged against the coercion of bodies in the capitalist system of production and um, encapsulating the abstractness of the capitalist world. You know? So that's, that's one against. And then obviously the other against is that it, dance can be counter-hegemonic and it has been in many ways. The work of Steve Paxton in that sense uh, has been counter-hegemonic against war, against uh, uh, alienation, um, against the domination of uh, the visual of, or the specular of, of the eye over dancing and trying to bring dance back to interaction between bodies. No? So in that sense, dance, I think, also has a trajectory of being against sometimes. And uh, uh, obviously, with the breakdown of uh, stable employment in uh, the Western uh, post-industrial societies, one could discuss that this is uh, the current condition of labor is in some vague sense after labor, after the society of work. Um, uh, and uh, their dancers share the lot of the working population, but also working population has come under the same pressures as dancers to be able to self-transform through their working uh, life um, and live in many aspects, precarious existence as artists typically did and do. Um, and uh, there it's evident that uh, dance after labor is really a dance of hardship as well. No? Um, outside of, of that Western purview, um, I feel that uh, the dance constitutes out of, out of collective endeavors in different fields than, than dance itself, more than, than as modern dance, uh, particularly in the socialist world, but I guess also, uh, I mean, I come from formerly socialist uh, country, this country that used to be Yugoslavia and is now uh, a number of uh, uh, independent nation states. Um, I feel that uh, there um, the separation between leisure and work was very different or was meant to be very different uh, and that um, dance in that sense encapsulates, encapsulates something else. Usually it's slate Slate is this collective choreography that was politically performed, but also other, other uh, collective performances of labor and uh, non-labor. Um, and I think it continues to persist through the collective efforts. You now, be being part of, or formerly being part of the dancing in Croatia, it's always a struggle, there will always be a struggle. There will never be something that people would say is a normal, uh, stable artistic field. I don't feel that's, that's possible uh, for various uh, reasons. Um, so I feel that there is no dance after labor because we are still not after labor. Uh, one way from post-socialist or uh, po uh, post-capitalist or communist 
uh, perspective to understand labor is uh, that communities collectively deliberate on the socially necessary labor that goes into reproducing the community and all the members of the community, which leaves a lot of time for self-determination, for dancing, in that sense. No? Um, so one could read it in that kind of way, that uh, uh, dance after labor is that free time once we have collectively assumed the decision-making about what's necessary. How do we split that work in, um, I guess, from everyone according to their ability and then to everyone according to their needs. Um, so, I don't know. There is another way to take uh, dance after labor. We have done uh, a show in 2007 called Changes, and there it was the fable of the ant and, and the grasshopper. No? So, obviously, it's clear what the dance is in, in that uh, fable. Um, so you are a starving dancer after labor, I guess. Over there, please. Azam, I think, right? Please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your presentation and for your discussion. This is Hazem Haider. I'm uh, from Egypt, one of uh, Global Connectors uh, members. and. Uh, yeah, well, it's completely different what you're talking about and about Egypt. If, if we compare dancing and labor, we are way far from that because of a lot of other uh, circumstances that are happening in the so Egyptian society, uh, which is being missed a little bit in the European and the Western country at, uh, at the same time. Because in our society, we don't consider dance as uh, as a job at all. It's not. The only job in dance is belly dance, and this is a lot of people even consider it as a prostitute because you know, it's a long history back to the 50s. Uh, but this reason, or the culture over there, it's also, it's a dancing culture, so everybody's dancing, but it's not a job no one is taking it seriously. So if I go and you say that I'm a uh, I'm, I work in dance, it's, they laugh. So what do you do else? Uh, but this leave the dancers in Egypt and I think mostly in the Middle East as well, hungry actually for dance, hungry for what they're creating. And they put a lot of, um, a lot of their souls and their emotions and what they're doing. On the contrary of what sometimes what I've seen in the European dance dancers and the European choreographers, it's becoming more as a job than as an art performance or a dance performance. Because it's fast, it's happening, the production over there, they have to produce a lot. And we don't have this, just like we have the opportunity the two uh, what we actually love with all the obstacles. So as a member of Global Connector, and this is opening this opportunity, how actually in these uh, situations, which is completely different, completely, completely different societies, how this kind of topic could transfer the Egyptian society into something that to bring back the dancing culture and to, to take it a little bit seriously than it is right now. Mm -hmm. And then trying to reach to the level what you're talking about right, about right now, which is dance against labor, which it's not really there yet. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Um, I can only comment. I agree fully, you know, and even in Croatia that uh, has embraced dance as an independent artistic field, or what you call genre, for a couple of decades now. It's still a child of love and constant struggle of people who 
our uh, dance artists, choreographers, to keep it going. And um, I have no recipe or, or I can't really comment on, on uh, other, other places. I just wanted to say how really constrained certain development of modern, postmodern, contemporary dance is to a very limited geography of the world and how it has emerged there against specific coercion of laboring bodies. But obviously we could discuss how dance exists and persists against forms of coercion that are outside of the capitalist core that were brought about by colonial, imperial, or an endogenous really, uh, uh, forces. So um, I think uh, there is a lot to say about popular dances and its uh, capacity to resist, and, uh, uh, but also its capacity to conform. You know? um, so I feel uh, that's a huge topic. I can't really do justice to it. I'm not really a uh, researcher of that. I was, in a way, generously talked into giving this talk by uh, Mariana, um, whom I thank greatly. But um, uh, yeah, hope I hope hopefully um, somebody else can answer that. And in the crowd, I'm sure there are people who are uh, just as knowledgeable um, as I am. Well, we have three days to continue the conversation. Thanks. So it's just the beginning of our conversation. Do we have any more further comments um, from the group? Questions? It's hard to see you guys. Oh, there's a there hand up a there. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm, I'm Ksenia um, Jurovic from uh, the BTF team and Nothing. one of the content committee members. Um, I'm really sorry that I'm kind of tooting our own horn, but um, for me, the, the, this talk was a brilliant beginning of this meeting. And I just wanted to uh, kind of briefly ask a practical question because I think we've seen uh, throughout the pandemic, but even earlier with um, some artists who have decided um, to, let's say, have a more sustainable um, working life uh, or working processes. Um, I just, I'm, because I'm thinking about this uh, platform work um, that has been um, very present, uh, or at least that I've noticed far more in the um, um, IT industry. I've, I've not seen it a lot in ours. Um, but would you say that, a, well, a mode of platform working is exactly how people did or how these sustainable people do um, rehearsals or do their processes with dancers? Uh, through actually Zoom meetings mm -hmm. that are happening um, with, I don't know, 3,000 miles apart where um, the choreographer is providing instructions for the material to the dancers there is a fairly, um, th that's a fairly strict structure. And if anything is surveillance, I would say that is, <laughs> in a way. So I'm just, um, I, I was just curious about this. It, it kind of ignited something in my mind. I, I guess, um, well, thank you for that question. It's, uh, it's something worth spending a, a bit of time on, uh, which I won't. Uh, I, I think it, one should really reflect on that uh, experience from the point of view of people who are doing that. Now, I, my intent is, once the Biennale finishes, to talk to the dancers. What, what is the tacit knowledge that you have acquired? What is it that other people can't see happening here? And how do you reflect on that? What, how do you understand your being in this um, disaggregated uh, durational performance 
commanded by uh, a technological system mostly um, with, that provides no rationale or uh, explanation for what it is that you are doing. Um, and I feel that we should also do uh, the same with our Zoom time, no? which, is, which was always uh, also a privilege that you could s stay at home and <laughs> not have to go work during the pandemic, um, uh, something that uh, Naomi Klein has called Screen New Deal. You know, some are forced to go out and, and provide uh, the essentials for the rest, and, and some have sort of the privilege or are, again, forced to stay at home and work uh, uh, behind the screen. So I think we need to reflect on that, um, primarily on the l low res of the image and the, uh, the regime of visibility that the screen sets. No, that's so different than what dancing in space typically is. And yet we record and uh, use recordings. It's nothing unusual. Uh, in rehearsals. And so I think we need to reflect how that uh, is changing our understanding of what we are doing. Is it uh, something that, um, well, it's not, it's beyond good and bad. No, it's what it is. No, what it is that uh, with uh, increased digitization is implied for uh, society at large? What is the transformation happening to broad, uh, uh, broad uh, aspects of society through, through digital work? And then we can maybe start from there with interesting inquiries. I think there will be kind of a lot of work uh, that will emulate that, but I think we need to go beyond emulating like, okay, what's the performance vis-a-vis -vis the screen that, that would be maybe just um, uh, ground level or um, starting point for a more interesting inquiry. I think we should continue the conversation out in the hall. I know there's a lovely uh, set of tables with lots of beautiful looking drinks waiting for us. But let's not lose the conversation. and. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank you, Thomas Lev, for this thought-provoking, full-on ideas that you have start given us here at the beginning of this meeting. And uh, thanks a lot. And let's uh, keep the thoughts going and develop further in the next three days. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.